I'm Ava DuVernay, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to this day that we've been waiting for for so long. So this um, seat, well, these seats will be filled with the cast and the, and the creators and all the people behind this wonderful final episode. So let's just jump in and get started. All right, look at them. Aren't they beautiful? They're fantastic, and they're all here. Exciting. So let's get started and just, and just dive in. Um, as the only other person to take the reins of this twice, besides Mr. Lucas. Um, what was the difference between your first day working on Rise of Skywalker and your first day working on Force Awakens? What happened in the middle? Were you more confident? Were you just as scared? What happened? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Ava, for being here. We are very lucky to have you. Thrilled to uh, be here. Uh, I, I think that the, we, the difference is that the, the, the pressures shifted. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know at the beginning of Force Awakens exactly what it would look like to have Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver and Oscar Isaac and John Boyega, and, you know, what would that cast be like? And we had to figure it out and discover it. The first day of, of Rise of Skywalker, we sort of knew some of those things. We knew those things were, were working. What we didn't know was everything else. And this was wrapping up, you know, not one film, not three films, but nine. And so the, the responsibility was significant. And the movie, I mean, this is a pretty big picture. I mean, the, the, the scale of the movie is pretty enormous, and we knew that none of that would matter, none of it would, would work if you didn't care deeply and track with the people. So the most important thing, the people, we were good with. You know, we knew we had the, this incredible cast who I think have gone above and beyond anyone's expectations and are truly spectacular in, in the film. Yeah. Just to continue to ask you, though, you know, there's, this is not, not, doesn't have a comic book to follow the story. There, there's no blueprint for this. This is coming out of you and Chris's head. And what you had talked about was, you know, wrapping up nine films. That's an awesome responsibility. So at the moment that you accept the invitation to do it, and it's the next day in your home, and, and you're thinking, oh, wow, I gotta, I gotta end this thing. Just personally, as a longtime fan of it, what was your personal process to get there? Did ideas start to come immediately? Were you quiet for a while? Did you well, there, there, there meditate? Of, because we had worked on Force Awakens, uh, Larry Kasdan and I and, and Michelle Rejwan and Kathy, uh, producers, we, we had talked about quite a few things back in the day. So it, it was a bit of sort of picking up where we had left off. And, and the fact is that, that what, what Ryan Johnson had done in uh, Last Jedi, you know, had set up some things that, that were, were sort of wonderful for this story. One of the things being that, that the cast was separated. The characters weren't together for the entire movie, essentially. So this was the first time that the group got to be together. We, Chris and I got together. We knew immediately we wanted to, you know, tell a story of a group adventure. There were some very specific things that we were both drawn to immediately. And we just started doing the thing that you do, which is you say, what do you desperately want to see? What feels right? Why, JJ? Why, JJ? Why this guy? The one thing I know about Star Wars and the one thing I know about these kind of tentpole movies is this unique combination of needing dramatic storytelling, gravitas, and a great sense of humor. And I think that there's few filmmakers that really embody both of those things and also have the capability to really manage something this huge. And JJ was my first choice. Yeah. So Absolutely. that was an easy one. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, Chris, when the initial call came in to co-write this screenplay, how long did the kid in you do somersaults before the writer in you started to hyperventilate? Because I literally, I mean, I don't even know how you approach something like this. I think I was on East 12th Street in Manhattan when, um, when I, I got, when I spoke to JJ. JJ had been calling and leaving messages and I was in a screening. And I, I didn't have JJ's cell phone number in my cell phone, so it was sort of a random 310 number. And I thought, why, it, why is this random person in Los Angeles calling me? Right. And finally, I listened to the message, and I, I sort of hyperventilated a little, and I called back. And he said, uh, hey, do you want to write episode nine with me? Wow. Um, didn't say the word star or war, just said right. episode nine. <laughs> um, so for a good eight minutes, I, I let myself sort of leap into the air, and then... Um, and then we realize, oh my God, we, we, have, we have to land this vehicle somehow. Yeah. We have to land the biggest Star Destroyer in the world on this, um, you know, on the head of a needle. 
and, uh, and then we, we got to work. I live in New York, but I came out to LA, and um, JJ and I just started in a, in a, at Bad Robot. There's a room with, um, with these white boards, with these blank white boards, and we just started writing in dry erase marker on, on white boards, and then eventually the boards became a Word document that was 10 pages, and then 50 pages, and then 121 pages, and then that became the script. I'm gonna jump into some of their, our, our newbies before we um, go to the OGs, as we call it in Compton, where I'm from. Um, so let's start with uh, Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell, who the hell are you? And what are you doing here? Um, you play uh, Zori Bliss. And I just have to tell you, love her. I mean, love her. She's hot, she's badass. From the moment you see her, you just, I just wanted to see more of her. Can you tell us a little bit about her? How did you approach her? And did the anonymity of being masked as an actor add something new for you to play with? Um, definitely. No, JJ called me or emailed me and said, do you want to be in Star Wars? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, but then he told me about the idea about the mask, and yeah, I, I love personally. I love the mask. I mean, that's my fantasy dream sequence that I can see everyone in the super tough version of myself costume, and no one can see me. <laughs> I mean, that's my dream. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's a real power play in, in in a way because you no one can really see what you're thinking, but you can see everyone else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was amazing, and you know, I've known JJ for so long, and I just feel like we have a shorthand, and uh, we speak the same language in a way, and I just feel like JJ got to finish a piece of history in a way by getting to do this, yeah. and it's just, he did such a great job. He really did. Jana, Naomi, welcome. This is a big thing to step into. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, for any actor with tons of experience and a lot behind them, it's a lot to step into, yeah. um, let alone someone who's newer to the scene. Yeah. So, Ken, did you, did you just come in and say, you know what, I'm going to walk on with just swagger. I'm going to be <laughs> fearless. Or, or, or did you just, you know, just kind of, did you, did you, how did you prepare? Did I you have a defining moment where you knew how you were going to approach this? You know, I felt like it was a, it was really through the physicality. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I felt like... Jana, Jana's strength was in her body, like she's a very grounded character. Um, so when I got to training, that's when I started to be like, okay. I got this. Right, okay, <laughs> like being able to do pull-ups and horse riding. And, and then I guess with that came like confidence that I hadn't previously experienced. And, and then working with JJ and figuring out like what the balance was between, you know, uh, strength of a character but also a vulnerable side, mm -hmm. you know, someone with a heart. We don't always have to just be like strong and fierce, but you can also, sometimes vulnerability is strength at the same time. So kind of finding that balance was really interesting. And I feel like we, we found it by the end. I mean, the, literally, and also like, cause we watched it yesterday. I'm not being funny. Like I, I left it, like my heart was beating so hard and it, it's the most visually beautiful thing yes. I've ever seen. It, it makes you feel like a child. And there was an element of feeling like a child on set that, I mean, it's like the whole cast allowed that to happen and JJ was the one who allowed us to be here. So mm -hmm. yeah, very grateful. Yes, well done. Kelly Marie Tran, you're back. <laughs> you're back. Um, what was the camaraderie like on set getting the gang back together? Like I said, as you're watching it, it's just so hard expanding to see everyone in the same scenes together. Um, what was it like actually doing it? Um, it was really wonderful. I think that there, from the last film, there seems to be such a, you know, bond between everyone. And then also the new guys, like everyone just feels... It sounds so cheesy and so cliche, and it is, but <laughs> it truly feels like everyone's a family and we're all just there to have fun and be part of something that's so much bigger than us as individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's a really cool thing to share with people, so. Mm -hmm. It felt like th these scenes denoted community, right, in the scenes um, within them, but they also were um, very closely, co closely connected to Carrie. Um, and so I wanted you to chat a little bit about um, you know, the feeling on the set around doing that work in her absence. Yeah. I think for, for myself, I can only speak for myself, um, there is sort of this idea that, you know, JJ has talked about ending nine films, and Carrie was such a big part of all of that. 
Um, so I think for me personally, there was a lot of wanting to honor this thing and do right by this thing. Jonas. Chewbacca. Why? Oh, love it. Why has he endured? Why do we love him? What are the qualities that endear him to us? You've thought about him more than, than the rest of us. What is it? I mean, for, for that, we, we have to go back to 1977 or whatever, and when, when George found Peter Mayhew mm -hmm. to play this character that was supposed to be, you know, nobody knew what it was going to be, and it's that thing where you don't know going into these things uh, uh, how it's going to look. And I think Chewbacca's endurance has to do with the fact that Peter's unique physicality that I sort of inherited and I try to bring on screen. It created this character that moves not quite like a human. It's very unique, uh, the way Chewbacca appears on screen, and he's, the way he's... Uh, so that, that, that's what created the memorability of that character. And what people, if they, even if they haven't seen Star Wars, they might know what Chewbacca is. Right. And that's, that's what I'm a custodian of. Yeah. And that's what I've taken. And uh, when Peter passed this last year, uh, I was heartbroken. And, but, I, but, I, but I like to think that in, or in, in this film, you know, I, I attempted to do him justice. And while uh, working with this incredible cast, uh, I'm really happy that we're part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves, mm -hmm. but that we, uh, we still get to uh, play and have fun in. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful to be a part of this. Anthony Daniels, the great. Can we give him a round of applause? Um, immense respect to you, sir. You've been in all of the Star Wars episodes. This is your final walk as C-3PO. Uh, it's been a joy to watch you through every film. Uh, so thank you for what you've given. It's thank really you for fantastic. saying that. And, and thanks to everybody who has who has kind of been fond of 3PO over the years. Some of you will be there. Yes. Thank you very much. More than fond. We love him. Uh, can you just sum up your journey as an actor? Um, you, you, you've done something in these films that hasn't been duplicated, that no one else has done. Uh, you've touched every one of them. You've worked across all of the worlds, all yeah. of the planets, all of the ideas and the stories. Um, I don't know how you'd start to summarize it, but maybe you can try. Well, I just realized in the, in the last few months something that I hadn't ever got before. Because I'd been in all of them and, and all the spin-offs and stuff, I am so close to it. And I said it's rather like having your nose up against the planet. You can't see how big that planet is. And gradually now, I'm beginning to get a, a perspective on it. And that comes from talking to fans, to, to people who say what it, Star Wars has meant to them over the years. It's meant something completely different to me. It's a job. It's kind of fun. It's kind of awkward sometimes. <laughs> uh, it's gay, as we all know. Uh, it's not a smooth ride. But, but finally, I'm getting to see it almost from the other perspective. And, and that's the perspective of the audience, who've been there all this time. And I'm really glad to have survived all this long enough to get this perspective. You've got a unique perspective that no one else has. Right. Thank you. Richard E. Grant. Your Twitter last night was epic. Your tweet was epic. Um, you were on cloud nine after seeing this film. I'd just like you to talk a little bit about your reaction to the film for those who did not see. Can you get back to that moment and share with us what you felt? I thought that Disney would sue me for... <laughs> you were very seconds. emotional. Because I think that you're not supposed to say anything about it, but um, I didn't tweet any spoilers about it at all. But the... the Having seen it first when I was a theater student when I was 20 years old, and before any of the younger cast were even born, uh, it's an extraordinarily emotional thing to see the, just the passing of time that goes through all of these movies. And it felt really like a combination of everything that I've read in the Bible, Greek mythology, The Wizard of Oz, all you know, rolled into one in this extraordinary summation of the whole story that delivers an emotional wallop at the end that I was totally unprepared for, and I was wiped out, and I barely slept. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Williams, so your career is much bigger than, than movies for many people than it is for me. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about Lando and how you approached it as an actor coming back to a part so many years later. Did you look at the 
previous films? Did you just, you know, use the script that was in front of you? What was your process as an actor to get back to him? I have a lot of admiration for this young man called uh, Monsieur J.J. Abrams. Yes. <laughs> and it was uh, pretty much, I like, you know, when I worked with George, you know, that was an opportunity to work with somebody who was really extraordinary. And here again, I have an opportunity to work with somebody who's really extraordinary. Actually, we worked together in, uh, when he was uh, doing Lost. I uh, played myself playing a killer, which I thought was a very interesting idea. <laughs> and I thought, this guy is really crazy. <laughs> but fabulously crazy. But anyway, um, this has been a great pleasure for me. Uh, coming back to uh, do Lando, um, I didn't. I didn't think that it would happen. Mm. I just wrote it off, you know, mm. and I said, "Well, I did what I had to do, and that was it." But when I got the uh, call from uh, JJ, and and then when we met, I just uh, I just sat there and I I just chuckled. <laughs> You know, because I thought it was just a, a wonderful gift. Yeah. So I'm a very, very happy human being right now. One of my favorite actors is up on uh, this this uh, dais, and um, I feel like he can do anything. His name is Oscar Isaac. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Poe feels different in this to me. Um, he's a bit, I think he was always supposed to be a bit of a swashbuckler, but he's like dropped into the swashbuckling thing in this like it's all you're dripping swash pants is it the pants and the knee-high boots really okay. i think it's, it's really michael kaplan that really brought the <laughs> swashbuckling to this one you know what am i seeing that feels different in him from the previous yeah i mean he's kind of always been a bit of a wild card energy uh, and figuring out where where he fits in the story and what story is being told uh and i think with this one uh you know jj and i talked a bit. I remember JJ being excited about kind of um, dirtying up the squeaky flyboy image that he's had for a bit and uh, just revealing a bit more of his personality. And I think that really comes uh, out because I've been taken away from my little box in space and, you know, I get to join my friends this time and you really get to see the interaction with the three and the hope that uh, I think that he in particular brings in this one. There's a uh, kind of a relentless, almost aggressive optimism that he has, uh, and and how that is tested, and uh, how he you know tries to be there for his friends, uh, tries to push them along even when it seems quite hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think also the way that we approached shooting a lot of these scenes, there was a looseness to it. Um, there was things shot in in big, beautiful choreographed takes that are just astounding to watch, where. You know, you'll follow one character walking through this maze of an amazing planet with all these stormtroopers and aliens, and you realize it's all this one amazing continuous take within us talking over each other. So it was that kind of trust uh, that, uh, that JJ kind of, uh, that, that allowed, uh, I think, a real spark of vitality. You and John, I mean, John is like walking charisma, like charisma on legs. Like if you look up charisma in the dictionary, it's John with legs. Um, the two of, it is, it's, I have a different dictionary, special one. <laughs> but the two of you have, it might be the greatest bromance in- It's you know, juicy. It's, it's hot, it's good. Um, but this connection, was it something that you all had to work at? Is it something that, that, that is you know, contrived and you really don't like each other? Like how, how does this, how, this clicking that we see on camera? Uh, John, can you speak a little bit to the relationship? When Oscar first came in, there was some other actor that I read with and the chemistry was, it, it was, it was blatant and there was a natural vibe between me and Oscar. I don't even know why. I just like the guy. Um, you know, and, and I just- He walked into my dressing room and it just, it was so sweet. He was like, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna run the scene before? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then we just like got in, in the dressing room like yeah, well, back, butt back to, to butt back. and like ran the scene together. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then f from then on, we've been in that position yeah. ever I since. I just think, <laughs> yeah, it's just it is what it is. It's just it is what a, it is. A, a good chemistry, and I think you know, I felt most comfortable when I was while auditioning doing the scenes where Poe was involved anyway, because mm -hmm. I've I've always liked you know. 
the guys in the film. I just like the boys, you know. I, I love that. I love that element, and 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 it was, I was glad that we could find that in our relationship. Yeah, it really comes through. It's beautiful. It's really fun to watch. Um, anything that you learned from this part that you were surprised that you learned now that you know we're we're at the final episode from when you first tackled it um, to now? A big lesson that that he he gave you when he talks to you in his head. And I'm not talking about JJ. I'm talking about Finn. Oh, uh, Finn. When Finn talks to you in his head, not when JJ talks to you in your head. Um, what does he tell you? I, I just like loyalty. Loyalty is something that I, I find very, very important in my personal life. Um, I think it's, it's super important to, to, to be loyal and to understand the way in which people want to be loved and communicated with. It's like, you know, proactive love is, is something that Finn does on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. Throughout the film, a lot of the times, Ray is going off on this, you know, really hard journey as, as, a, as a, a character blessed with so much power and Finn tries to support her in, in, in that journey and sometimes it's hard. And, you know, in my real life, you know, if I've, if I've tried to get in contact with you three, four times and you're going off, I'm going to leave you alone. Mm. Finn's going to come for you and, and, and try and make it work regardless. So, Adam, you... Uh so am I technically in the proper Star Wars lore? If I don't just call him Kylo Ren, he's also Ben Solo, right? Like if I say Ben Solo, is that also accurate? Or no? Can, can he not be Ben Solo? Or is he rejected Ben Solo and I should not use those words? Wow, he's really thinking about it. <laughs> uh, yes and no. OK, well, let me ask you. My question is. In your performance of Kylo Ren, did you allow Ben Solo and who he was before to influence the way that you played Kylo? Or was, once you entered into Kylo Ren, were you in a completely different space? Did you bring his legacy and his heritage into the performance with you in this piece? In, the, in this one? Yes. Uh, I, I think maybe subconsciously. I don't think it's a, you know, when people are actively trying to deny a certain part of their lives, I think they can do it pretty successfully. And then it, it just uh, turns into what, ha what is happening around them that brings it out in them. So I, I think maybe, but it's not, I don't think it's something that we uh, actively talked about, about playing it, but it, it definitely is a thought to have. And since, since you... That's, again, I think that's a testament to the writing that yeah. uh, from the beginning it was never someone you know, the, for, from the beginning, it being called Force Awakens was in, intentional in that it was the Force Awakening for both sides, the light mm -hmm. and the dark. And JJ, uh, even in those first meetings, talking about someone who is uh, uh, unformed and not a, you know, quintessential, in, in control, you know, uh, um, <coughs> of his faculties, knows where he fits in the, you know, which again is helpful for me as an actor because we are we are figuring out the same thing. It, it totally echoes what's going on in the story, you know, especially in the first one, new cast, figuring out where you fit, uh, it, you know, in a legacy that spans, you know, um, so much time. Uh, the end. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that that was helpful, but I, I guess I guess in similar in that. I guess it's a subconscious thought in playing it. I guess it's also a subconscious thought as me as an actor sure. thinking about it. So Daisy, would you say the biggest demands were more the physicality or the depth of some of the scenes emotionally? And which one? Uh, it's a good question. Because, Thank you. Um, with the physical stuff, you train and train and train and then the adrenaline helps you like on the day to like do the thing but obviously the stamina needs to be there for you to continue to do the thing. But I would say uh, I was more tired emotionally because um, there really wasn't a day where I was like, no, it's just a quick scene. Uh, coming from the last one, which was quite heavy, even the joyous scenes I found very strange mm. uh, to do. And then obviously there's a lot of other stuff that's going on. And, and it's also tricky because understanding what JJ was asking of me, I'd be like, I know what you're asking, I just can't quite get there yet. Mm. So that was probably the most tricky thing and sustaining that um, emotion. And there's a certain, there's more of a, I would say like a, a, a singular intention that um, was, was tiring. Because as well, even in the emotional scenes, there's like a physical um, 
containment that mm. is tiring. So really, I've not answered the question, and both things were hard. <laughs> But what, but, but what was it about the joyous scenes that, that created more of an obstacle for you? It's just so strange, because I've gone from, uh, you know, a film with a lot of being like, please be my friend, Luke. And he's like, go away. And I'm like, no, please. Um, and then, you know, very emotional stuff with Adam. Um, so coming back was so great, but it would be so... Um, like, easy to just flow into it that then you're like, am I acting? Like, is this what the, is required? Because I'm basically bouncing off of Oscar and John and Jonas and Anthony in such a joyous way that you just feel like you're having a chat with your pals. Right. So it's not like difficult in like a oh, way, but it's strange wondering how that general vibe is going right. to translate into a scene. So for George, it was really important to him that these films mean something. That they aren't just, you know, popcorn films. That there's some universal truth to them. That something is being conveyed. That that this is um, soul food. It's supposed to stick to your ribs. Um, and he wanted to say something through the ones that he worked on. You're the only director that's done it more than once besides him. Um, so in this final piece, I mean, I always hate getting this question, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, my friend. What does this mean, and what do you want to say with it? Uh, that's a Terrific question. Um, I like to think that when you're working on something, especially something, and I say something like this as if these kind of things come along all the time, and they, they never do. Um, and I'm, I'm still great, grateful to that call from Kathy. Uh, the, the truth is that there's the movie that you know you're presenting to the world, and then there's the thing that you're doing, not necessarily secretly, but, but meaningfully. We live in a crazy world. We live in a crazy time. And Star Wars, for me, was about hope. And it was about community. It was about the underdog. And it was about bringing people together and seeing all oddballs represented and the most unlikely friends and the most unlikely places and the family that you make is, is really your family. You know? And so to tell a story that is, of course, a giant spectacle and, and, and a sort of, you know, like you say, the blockbuster rapping. But the thing that mattered to me most, more than all the spectacular, unbelievable, I, I would argue, best work ILM has ever done, all the departments going beyond expectations, the, the thing that matters, I would say, most and only in the film is, is really the people who are sitting here, you know, and, and what you're watching and the eyes of the characters and the heart of the characters. So for me, rather than give away sort of themes that Chris and I talked about doing, you know, from the beginning and what, what our specifics are, I will say that it really is about hope and it's about coming back to a sense of possibility, about unity, and, and it's, if Star Wars can't do that for us, I don't know what can. 